Many Muslims are disappointed with the lack of action by Muslim and Arab states in the region. Some have called for war, while others would just like to see some sort of economic action. I personally don't think people understand the weakness and dependency these nations have on Israel in the West. Without trying to make excuses or provide justifications for what appears to be an absolute betrayal of the Palestinian people, I would like to go through the interests and positions of the Middle Eastern nations so that people can gain a deeper understanding of the complexity of the geopolitics of the region. I'd like to start first with Turkey. Erdogan has been quite vocal in his condemnation of Israel. However, many are disappointed with his lack of ability and or willingness to take economic action against the state of Israel. So can you break down for us Turkey's relations with Israel and the U.S. to give us a better understanding of Erdogan's sensitive position? Let me make it clear. We're analyzing the position. We're not justifying it. You asked me to analyze the position. You didn't ask me my opinion on the, on, on the position. And we're going to continue in that regard. I will just say one thing, because I noticed in your question about understanding that they don't have the power to do whatever. You know, my job is a political risk consultant. Um, there are many governments that they are also clients and, and I advise their ambassadors or sometimes their foreign ministries or the like. When you hear the questions they ask, we might believe that the Muslim world doesn't have agency. Their questions suggest that the Muslim world does. A lot of the questions are, what if this Muslim country does this? Mm. What if Turkey opens more military bases? What if, you know, like they express a, a concern over a scenario that agency might actually be deployed. And in asking that question, they are affirming that they see agency in the Muslim world, even if the Muslims don't see it, which is why I'm a firm believer that the Ummah always has power. It's just that there are conditions to manifest that power and part of that condition is perseverance in the struggle that results from manifesting that power, which I think many of the Ummah are not necessarily ready for, particularly those in the West. I think other parts of the Ummah they are. But having put in that aside, let's put ourselves in the position of Rajab Tayyip Erdogan. You find gas in the Eastern Mediterranean and you believe that you have a right to access that gas. The problem, however, is as a result of you standing with the Arab people in the Arab Spring, you alienated nearly everybody who is around the Mediterranean, Egypt, Syria, Israel, Lebanon, not so much, but you know, not only that, you, in order to access it, Greece also wants access, so does Cyprus, there are maritime issues, so you're falling out with Cyprus over the Turkish issue in the north, because they don't want to recognize, you know, they talk about two state solution or one state or the like, and the Greeks are upset at your position on Cyprus as well. So if you look on the map, Greece doesn't like you, Cyprus doesn't like you, Israel doesn't like you, Syria doesn't like you, Egypt doesn't like you. So that's literally everybody that's relevant in that Mediterranean. In 2019, the UAE-backed warlord Khalifa Haftar in Libya launches an attack on the capital. If Haftar takes the capital, you know for a fact that your entire maritime interest in the Mediterranean will be at the mercy of those countries that don't like you. They will cut you out of any deal. And the proof is that Israel, Greece, and Egypt try to sign their own economic zone with regards to access in there. And that's why when, when they try to push back against Erdogan's access to the Mediterranean, that's why Erdogan announced that unilateral maritime, maritime border with Libya, where he literally just created a, a border and said, I'm allowed access because this is the border with Libya. Erdogan wrestles with the Israelis on, on that front. And he's wrestling with Saudi, wrestling with UAE, wrestling with the like. He takes in 5 million Syrian refugees, knowing it might cost him politically, domestically. I remember being in Turkey in 2014. I know anecdotes are bad form, but tolerate me just on this one. I remember being in Turkey in 2014, 2015. And I remember Turks on the streets saying, you know, Erdogan gives them free education, free health care, whatever, and I have to pay for it. I do believe Erdogan took in those Syrian refugees knowing he would pay a political price for it. 2016 coup, then 2019 when he has the elections, it's after Libya, so 2019 you have Libya. I know it sounds like I'm going like everywhere, but you'll understand like where it's coming to. 2019 comes, he's wrestling in Libya, but then he has the mayoral elections in Istanbul, Ankara, and he loses them because of the refugee question. The reason why I say the refugee question is because on the night before the vote, Bin Ali Yildirim, the, the AK party candidate in Istanbul, Erdogan's candidate in Istanbul, he does a last gasp effort to try to win votes by coming out and saying, I promise to deal with the issue of the refugees as well. Something that shocked everybody. I remember sitting in Istanbul that night. 
I was having dinner with Turkish friends and one of them says to me, Sami Bey, I'm really sorry. Like, I'm really, really sorry. Like, it doesn't reflect our real position. I said, dude, like, politics is what it is. Erdogan wakes up one day after raising interest rates for 20 years and says, interest rates is haram. So I need to bring them down now violently. And the currency starts crashing. So the economy starts crashing. And then he has a presidential election, existential crisis. If he loses, the sense is that everything would be reversed. And he throws everything at this presidential election. Six parties unite with Kilesh Darulu. Erdogan wins the election, but the nationalists also get a sizable vote. So it's clear that people didn't vote for Erdogan, they voted against Kilesh Darulu. I'm talking about the Muslims specific, because Muslim 35, 36% block. It's clear to Erdogan that these Muslim bloc did not vote in support of Erdogan, they voted in fear of Kilesh Darulu, expressing their discontent with what Erdogan is doing. Erdogan says to himself, look, you know what? I'm struggling. I've got economic crisis. The Americans are on my back. They won't sell me F-16s and they're treating me badly. EU is not moving on the issue of the customs union. I'm wrestling in the Mediterranean. I need the access to the gas. They're trying to cut me out of that uh, gas. Right? He tried in 2021, he tried to invite the Israeli energy minister to Istanbul and then the invitation got ruined by when Israel bombed Gaza again. Erdogan says, I'm stuck. I'm wrestling with Russia in Central Asia because they're upset that I set up the Turkey Council and I'm gaining influence in Central Asia. And Putin is trying to make a point. He sent troops to Kazakhstan to rescue the government, to send a message to the regimes that you might be getting closer to Erdogan, but I'm the real power here in this region. Erdogan says, you know what? I've done 10, 11 years of antagonism. I need the breathing space. Like, I need the breathing space. And then he gets shocked and stunned when he reads the news that at the G20 summit, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Israel, uh, and India have announced the Middle East Corridor, which is going to be a direct challenge to the Belt and Silk Road of the Chinese. The Chinese are angry that it's been announced at the G20. And Turkey realizes, or Erdogan realizes, that the whole economic landscape of the region is going to change and Turkey is going to be kicked out of it. Like it's going to, it's going to. So Erdogan says, you know what? I need to slow down a bit. Goes to Bin Salman, tells him, yeah, Bin Salman, I'll kick out the Khashoggi case, please. And I ask if I'm sorry. Like, I'm sorry. Let's just reconcile and let's make peace. Bin Salman doesn't forgive him because Bin Salman believes Erdogan is the reason everybody found the bash. Erdogan could have just ignored it. So uh, Bin Salman tells him on security issues, I'm happy to have some bioreactors. Beyond that, I'm not. Uh, don't count on me too much. UAE sees a golden opportunity. They invest 50 billion, and the UAE commentators they say, "Look how the Sultan is selling out his allies now for us." And you know the Turks, you know, you know, they say, "Look, we're stuck. We can't do anything." And they tell, you know, their Muslim Brotherhood allies in Istanbul, "We need you to be quiet now on you on on CC." And and they thought it's a joke in the beginning, like it's a friendly. And then when they really start, they say, "Listen, no, like we're serious." Like you need to stop. So they start leaving Istanbul. Bin Salman, uh, then Erdogan says, you know what, Mediterranean gas, I don't need to be antagonistic. Haftar is no longer, you know, taking over Tripoli because I intervened and the like. I want to make peace with Sisi so that I can agree on a deal to, on how we can extract that gas in the Mediterranean. And I want to talk to the Israelis to establish. So Erdogan says, look, I need a breather. I need to solve my currency. I'm going to talk to the Israelis about setting up a joint gas pipeline so we can all have access to the gas. I will talk to the Saudis in the hope I get more investment so they can calm down in their lobbying against me. I will talk to the UAE. They're going to invest and we're going to work together in Libya, in Somalia, and these other places in Ethiopia and Sudan where we have mutual interests as well. Uh, even in Sudan, they have mutual interests. Uh, Turkey does have contacts with the other militia that is backed by the UAE. And Erdogan says, look, Muslims just need to understand. I tried and now I'm struggling. Then Gaza, October 7th, takes place and it completely humiliates him because at a time in which he's trying to wind things down, He's now being asked to escalate. So he comes out and he says, you know, we want to be neutral and reconcile with you. And the Turks get so angry at the stance that they start taking to the streets in protest, not only in support of Gaza, but in protest against Erdogan. There's a video that goes viral of a Turkish guy who says, Erdogan, we, you called us out in 2016 in the coup and we came out for you. Call us out for Gaza. What are you doing? Mm -hmm. And Erdogan eventually, you see his speech start changing from very neutral to he does a rally where he gives them the speech that they want to hear. But he's very careful. He says, I can't work with Netanyahu. I don't want to talk to Netanyahu. I don't want to deal with Netanyahu. I don't want to with Netanyahu. To give something to the crowd while telling the Israelis, guys, like, 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 like come on. Like, like, not now, like of all the places. That's not to justify Erdogan's position. I truly believe, honestly, even, even analysis-wise, I believe that Erdogan does have convictions when it comes to Muslim issues. I don't think Turkey changes in the way that it's changed in the past 20 years unless you have conviction. 
I don't think you go to the Hagia Sophia for the first time in the history of secular Turkey the night before an election. I don't think a leader leaves Ataturk's grave, abandons, doesn't go there and goes instead to Hagia Sophia. I don't think you do that unless you have conviction. I don't think you bring about those changes unless you have conviction. I do believe, this is why people say sometimes you're soft on Erdogan. It's because Erdogan, I hate the, the, the pragmatism and I, I, I denounce it and I think that it's wrong. That doesn't mean I think he doesn't have conviction. There's a difference between someone like bin Salman who is proactively de-Islamizing the kingdom and showing no remorse for Gaza for his personal interest and between Erdogan who pursues personal interest but you can feel he's, you know, it's like I wish it did not have to be this way. I think there's a difference between that. And that's why I think with Erdogan for Gaza, he says, one, what can I realistically do? What I think he's under heavy pressure for is that there are reports, and I, I, I haven't confirmed them, but there are reports that Turkey, that trade, the, there's accusations and it, it, went, it went around in social media, and this is what put pressure on Erdogan, that trade between Turkey and Israel increased 30% since October 7. Increased or decreased? Increased 30% since October 7. Now there are reports saying that Erdogan is taking Israel off the export list. This was last week, taking Israel off the export list. There was a, a list that went viral in Turkey that listed companies that are trading with the Israelis. And there were accusations, you know, that people close to Erdogan, you know, that they were also involved in this particular trade. The, it also caused a, a reflection of what Turkey has done or Turkey has done for Palestine. By that, what I mean is, Egyptians, albeit I think they exaggerate a little bit, the Egyptians say we fought two wars for Palestine, which I think is a bit of an exaggeration because the two wars were not really fought for Palestine. They were fought for other reasons that Palestine happened to provide an umbrella under which they were able to fight. One of the fights was for Sena because it was taken by, by, by the Israelis. and there. But you look at Turkey, like even when they kicked out the Israeli ambassador, they didn't actually kick out the Israeli ambassador. The, Israel withdrew the ambassador because the Turks were so angry. And then Turkey left its ambassador for a few days and then realized it's untenable. I need to withdraw my ambassador as well. It's these things that raise doubts about Erdogan and that it makes clear that Erdogan believes himself to be in such a situation that this October 7 came at the worst time. I need to tell down. I don't have the power to push forward. And that's why in reality, he's become irrelevant to what's happening in Gaza and Palestine. And a lot of people are upset like with his stance. And even when he tried to justify it, in reality, it makes it quite difficult given that you know he's a lion in Syria and unable to do anything like in Israel itself. And, and it is like bitterly, bitterly disappointing to see Erdogan's position on it. And I think that, you know, some of my clients, they ask after this genocide, will Tur trade with Turkey and Egypt go back to normal, trade with Turkey? And I can't lie to you. I can't in good faith rule it out. I can't rule out that Erdogan will very quickly go back to normal trade with Israel. Because in his view, Israel is fundamentally important to Turkish economic interests. And Erdogan says, if I have to calculate it, the Turks will forgive me for dealing with is for working with Israel if I provide them greater comforts. But they will not forgive me if I go against Israel and they suffer greater discomfort. Mm -hmm. And I think in reality, that's why it's not that I'm soft on Erdogan, but I think <clears throat> he reflects a wider trend, which is like Pakistan, like Imran Khan, which is, you know, at the end of the day, Imran Khan made a good statement. He said, they're not coming after me, they're coming after you. I'm just standing in the way. The point being that it's an environment that lends itself to Erdogan making these conclusions as well. Which is, if I knew the Turks had my back, if I did something on Israel, like they had my back, I'd probably do something. But I know if I go to Israel, the Turks won't have my back. Trust nothing. No.